So we should be able to see the screen, hopefully, that says German Q&A. And I uh, want to welcome everybody. Thanks for coming again to this is our second webinar for the summer. And uh, hopefully, as you all know, since we're not traveling, um, we got, I, I say I have spare time on my hands, but <laughs> I don't know where the time goes. It goes so fast, I don't know what I do with myself. But we are hoping to do some more uh, throughout the summer and fall probably. So if you have any ideas for topics that you'd like to talk about, it doesn't always have to be German. Um, we specialize in Germany and I'm going to introduce myself. Sorry, I know a lot of you know me and some of you don't. Um, but you can send that in chat or send it to send ideas uh, to uh, info at familytreetours.com. So I will introduce us. My name's Kathy Worth, and I am the owner of Family Tree Tours Heritage Travel. And I'm joined today with my partner, my German partner, Matthias Utoff, who's in Germany tonight. And uh, he'll be uh, handling the chat box, and um, I will probably ask him to join in every once in a while. So for those of you that are experienced uh, German uh, researchers and there might be some of you on here that are not are just starting out um, I wanted to start with um, talking about 10 things to know when starting German genealogy research and this is just a few quickie things that when you're when you are starting that you would have been thankful maybe somebody would have told you or uh, we would have been thankful if somebody would have told us just things to remember and if you have any ideas those of you that have been doing German research for a long time. If you have any other ideas for this list, just send those on in the chat too. So the first thing is to always, always, always look at church book records, both here and there. If you, of course you know, and if you don't know already, when you get to Germany and you're trying to research there, you're going to have to research in German church books um, in the old script. And it's helpful if you're still looking for a hometown you don't know your German hometown yet, um, it's, it's a good resource to use German, I mean not only German, but church book records here in the States to see if you can find their mention of a hometown there. And also it's good for learning who they were affiliated with, who was uh, sponsors at children's baptisms, and who was their witnesses at their marriage. And I know a lot of people say, well I don't know what religion they were, or they weren't any religion. Um, and that's you know, possible. They could have dropped any kind of religion when they came here, but when they were in Germany, they had to have a religion. And it was Catholic or Lutheran or uh, Lutheran Reformed, and so they would have had some kind of an affiliation when they came here. And a lot of times those original immigrants uh, might have kept it up for a while, and maybe later they, they broke away, but uh, it, it doesn't hurt to look to see whether there was any church records for the immigrant, especially if they were married in uh, the states here. A lot of times in the Protestant records, they uh, mention their hometown. Uh, so always, always, always look at church books. They're a very important resource. Second thing to know is there is no national census in the 18th or 19th century in Germany. Um, we are lucky here that we have such a great um, census records that go back so far to kind of help us to figure out where our people lived. But uh, in Germany, they were not united as Germany until 1871. So everybody had you know, their own little kingdoms, principalities, dukedoms, and nobody, they might have done censuses in their little province, but uh, not a national one. So that is you know, a problem for us. Uh, we don't have that resource to check there. So that's why church book records are so important. Um, if your surname has an A, E, O, E, or U, E, it could mean that your surname had an umlaut. So, of course, we didn't have that in our alphabet, and so a lot of times they just added an E to that. I guess that's the way the, the uh, blend of those words sounded, so they, they just added an E to it. But if you have a Mueller, M-U-E-L-L-E-R, it could have been Mueller, M-U, umlaut in Germany. So just don't... Um, Discount that. Don't not look at those kind of names just because you think that yours was spelt with a U-E. Have a list of commonly used German words in church books and their translations. Um, oh, Matthias, could you put the handout in the chat? I, I meant to do that as soon as I got on. Um, 
we're going to uh, put a handout in the chat that's a PDF, and then you can click on it and uh, get the handout. Because I've got a list of um, uh, Linkfar, the commonly uh, German words used in, in church books from Family Search. And also, you want to have a list for Latin words, because if you're using some Catholic records, it will be uh, in Latin. And again, don't expect names to be spelled the same every time. Be flexible. I'm sure a lot of you that have been looking in, in German records and church books and other kinds of records, you might find that sometimes the person that's writing it down spelled it different ways in the same document. So you have to be a little bit flexible with that. Uh, only knowing Prussia is not enough, I'm sorry to say. You'll have to keep looking for a more specific area. I can recommend that you Google maybe, uh, you know, historical maps of Germany uh, from like 1815 and, and then 1871 or so and just see what the borders were because at different time periods, Prussia was, uh, you know, big, a big, big. So it, not only in the East, I had people that mentioned Prussia on census records here in the 1870s and 80s and only by using U.S. church book records did I find that they were really from Westphalia, a little towns in Westphalia, which is, you know, way over uh, very west of Germany. So um, Prussia is going to be a little bit difficult, but not impossible. So you just have to keep looking uh, a little bit more. If you have a hometown name, um, you need to check Myers Gazetteer or some other atlas to see how many towns by the same name there are. Uh, a lot of people, especially if you're just starting off and if you're lucky enough to get a name, um, and it may be even misspelled and you haven't been able to find it on a map or, or you know, that's, you just got the name and there you are, you think you've got it. Uh, you have to check to see if there's other towns by that same name. Um, in some of my beginning classes, I always give the example of if, if somebody landed in New York and said, I want to go to Springfield, where would you send them? There's lots of towns by the same name. And speaking of that, our first, first webinar that we did earlier on the summer, um, the three steps that you need to prepare for heritage travel, I do have that on our website now, familytreetours.com, under videos and the German videos. And so if you wanted to watch that, we go into detail about how to use Myers Gazetteer and then also how to, to find church book records. So you might want to check that out. Uh, number nine, um, this is probably the biggest question I get before trips or people tell me that they want to go and see their uh, grandpa or great grandpa's grave site. And I have to uh, burst the bubble and say that you probably aren't going to see that because um, graves in Germany are recycled. And at the, towards the end of this presentation, because I, I get this question all the time, um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So let's do that. Um, and lastly, everything's not online. You must use books and microfilms and gazetteers and other uh, things. Um, I see so often on, um, especially on these, you know, they're online so much now and everybody gets frustrated because this is not online or the church book's not online for this or this isn't online. Uh, there's lots of stuff that's still not online yet, and I really encourage if you're new to start um, going really local by you know, finding them in the census here and find out where they lived and then try to find the local historical society or genealogy society. Or I always look to see if the little town that I'm looking for has a public library and see if they have a genealogy department because um, there's lots of information locally that you know might uh, not be, might not ever be online. And you know those are the people that probably recognize the names more often or have uh, local information. So uh, just do that. And, and I should have another number 11 on here because the most important thing to remember when you start, if you're just starting, is make sure you source stuff because I'm sure some of or most of you could probably uh, tell them how you're looking back at stuff you did 10 years ago or 20 years ago or longer and say, now where did I get that from? So you always have to write down the sources and also source um, you just have a research log for when you're starting there, you know, what you find and what you don't find. I can't tell you how many times I've redone things because I didn't write down that I've already looked in that resource. So that is my top 10 things to know when starting German research. And as I said, if you've got some, send, send it on in, in chat and we'll add to our list. 
So what we had done is in our last newsletter and online on Facebook or something, I asked for people to uh, send in questions. So um, I'm going to answer some of those questions. And unfortunately, I didn't ask um, for a name. So I don't know if the person that asked these questions are, are online here. But so all of these um, questions and answers that we we found for you, were, we, they are in the handout. And hopefully, I sent the kids a copy. And if not, we'll, hopefully, he's posting it in chat for you. Um, it's a PDF. So the first question was, how easy is it to find land, birth, marriage, and death records from Essen, Germany? So as I said, I don't know who sent this. So um, my first question to that, whoops, going backwards. First question to be is, which Essen are you talking about? Um, and that's why I was just stressing about looking at Myers Gas and see how many towns by the same name. So if you just telling me Essen, we don't didn't know where specifically to look. So according to Myers Gazetteer, which the link for that is in the handout also, there are four Essens. And, um, and so if, if you do know the town name, but first it's best to find out whether which one you're looking for. But um, FamilySearch.org has to see what for the town, what has been filmed and are digitized, what records have been, the church records, civil registration or whatever. So out of these four, if we determine which one it is, then you can go to Family Search. So the first Essen is um, near Oldenburg, and it's a predominantly Catholic uh, region up there, or this particular town. And the church records are on the site Matricula. And there's a link for that in the handout. And Matricula is a German, uh, not specifically German, but they have German, uh, Austria, um, which is, I'm not sure if they have Polish, some Polish records on there, but it's a free site that you can look at church book records. And it started off um, with just kind of a few from Bavaria and uh, Austria, but it's really getting a lot more uh, records on there. So um, I did show you in, like I said, the first video that we did this year, uh, we do uh, show you how to use matricula also. Um, Family Search has some um, films or, or things for Essen in Oldenburg. It's a mix of computer printouts and actual church records. And um, so you can try that. Um, the uh, land records would either be in the Landes Archive in Osnabrück or Oldenburg. And I put links for those in the um, uh, handout. So the second one is Essen by Hoya in Hanover. And so when I say it's Catholic parish, so right away we go to um, Myers Gaz. I go to Myers Gaz to see. Is your losing your admit job there? Um, to see uh, what what the where the parish records might be. So and yet I just want to remind everybody too, if you're new starting out, that um, not every village had its own parish. Sometimes they would have had to walk a couple blocks over or a couple blocks, a couple miles over. And uh, Matthias, mute yourself. I can hear you. And uh, so anyway, in Myers Gaz, the uh, parishes for this particular Essen, uh, the Catholic parish is in a town called Twistringen, and those records are on matricula. Um, it's Protestant parish is in Essendorf, and the records are on archeon.de, which again, Archeon is a Protestant uh, church archive uh, website that is gathering records from all different uh, Protestant archives, church archives in Germany. Um, you know, not everything is on there yet, and not everything may not ever be on there. It depends on the, the parish and the uh, archive. But for the most part, there's lots of them that are contributing records to that. And it's, it is a pay site. It's not terribly expensive. Um, you can buy it for a month or so, or even, I don't know, 20 days or whatever. But for a lot of areas of Germany, there was, they were never, some of their records were never, uh, either microfilmed or recorded anywhere. So for a lot of us that were waiting for places like um, um, Niedersachsen or Hanover area that never filmed their records, this is a godsend. Um, link for that, again, is in the handout. Um, land records would probably be in the state archive in Hanover. Better here. So, sorry, third, uh, third Essen is up near Osnabrück, 
and this is a product there is a protestant church in essen and the records will probably be on archeon in the future um, as i said osnabrück area was uh, one of the places that was a holdout for letting anybody microfilm their records uh, they just recently let the catholic some of the uh, catholic archives have let some of their records be put onto that matricula so we're thinking that maybe they will do that for the Protestant records, put them on Archeon in the future. Uh, the land records are probably at the archive in Osnabrück. As I said, I don't know what kind of land records that you're looking for, um, whether it be uh, farm histories or if they owned a house in town. Um, I, I have, haven't ever worked with land records too much because my people didn't have land too much. But anyway, the links for the, the um, archives are in the handout. And the last Essen is uh, in the Ruhr Valley. Um, and this is a big city. And uh, so there'd be lots of churches there. There's 21 Catholic and 10 Protestant, uh, according to uh, Myers Gaz. So um, you can see Family Search for this Essen. They have some records on there, a mix of the uh, Catholic, some Catholic parishes, some uh, Protestant parishes. Uh, but again, you know, you'd have to narrow down where what church your people went to. So in cases like this, when your people are from big cities, sometimes you're going to have to look at all of the, the church records that were in the city, um, unless there's some way to figure out um, where they where they went to church. Maybe, you know, some places you can figure out by uh, bigger cities. I'm, I'm sure Germany's, you know, had city directories and stuff is probably far, farther back than some that we have. But for this one town, the Catholic ones are probably uh, at the local churches in town, the, the, the book, the records, and the Protestant ones will probably be on Archeon in the future. Um, we did include the civil death records online at the state archive. Um, when I say civil records, uh, they did not start into all over Germany until about 1876. So a lot of people will think, well, I, I, my people were gone um, by then, so I, I don't have to look at that. But their parents or their siblings or cousins, so it doesn't hurt to take a look at these uh, civil records because uh, some family members could have been left behind and you would um, uh, maybe find something by making a connection there. Um, they all are so on some are on family search, but they were these these uh, civil records, but uh, they haven't been digitized and they were still on microfilm in the vault. So I would I would go to use the archive site if you're interested in that. So that is the answer to how easy it is to find land, birth, marriage, and death records from Essen, uh, Germany. So you have to know which town you're talking about and then um, use these. Uh, some resources, Family Search, Archeon, and Matricula is the top three for finding church book records. There's a few other places also. So, let's see. Next question was, I think I found the hometown of my immigrant um, German ancestors, but still have not found the town where a few others came from. Can you walk through a best approach for determining the town where an ancestor came from? And this is kind of going back to you know the uh, beginning you know that if you're a, a beginner researcher I and I have a question for you uh, if you think you found the hometown of one of your ancestors how did you find that one so you kind of have to do the same thing that you did to, to find that one unless it was just given it to, given to you uh, but now you know that you've got to prove that uh, that person actually came from that hometown so the basic things you have to just you have to look in, in uh, every place here in the United States for some mention of a hometown because, as I said, there is no um, census records over there. And everybody, you know, got a lot of common names and a lot of common towns. And so, you, you know, you just have to find uh, something on some document here. I stressed about the local church records previously. Um, obits, um, sometimes they have an obituary. If you lived in a, a town here in the States that had German newspapers, don't forget to look at the obituaries in the German newspapers because they might be uh, mentioned in there. Um, always look for uh, you know, the church and civil death records for the people. I have helped a person um, 
to find a hometown one time in a death record. The person had been in the country for 50 years. And, um, uh oh, everything okay? <laughs> I'm hearing a little, little noise in my ear, so I didn't know if we were got lost connection or not. Anyway, um, you know, when they got buried from the church, you look in that. Uh, in those records too. Gravestones might tell you a specific and it might just give you a um, an area in which will that would help you. You know, sometimes if you see on a tombstone that it says, uh, you know, from, from Baden or, you know, Bavaria or whatever. So that's gonna narrow it down a little bit. And remember um, wills and probate records and um, cemetery. Sometimes the cemetery record has different um, records than, um, you know, other the um, church or whatever. So somebody else might have given the information. Uh, probate, I just tried to tell a quick story here. I used to think, I would try to look for wills for, for men in the family, but I never really thought about it for women too much, and especially in you know, the mid 1800s or end of the 1800s. I thought, oh boy. Well, my great grandmother uh, immigrated from uh, Germany here in 1885. She was born in 1860 something, and she died in 1924. And I was lucky enough that somebody gave me a copy of her will. And she had, um, but then she died here, well, she died in St. Louis. And I, you know, if I would have looked for it, I could have found it. Uh, but she had um, eight children, seven which had immigrated and one that stayed behind in Germany. So in her will, she left her oldest daughter her clothes. Why she thought she would want those clothes, I don't know. But it listed the street address and the place that they lived. So if I wouldn't have known it already, which I think I did at that time, um, there would have been my hometown. So don't forget about probate. The US Census, I mentioned that again. If your people were here, 1850s, 60s, 70s, um, they might have said, because of Germany not being united by then, they might have said you know, that they were from Hanover, or they were from um, Mecklenburg, or you know, Hessen-Darmstadt, or Hessen-Nassau, or something, or the dreaded Prussia. But, um, you know, kind of look and see whether, um, if you can narrow it down a little bit by our U.S. census. Naturalization records kind of help you with that too. They, you know, if they were, if they naturalized early, they might have said that they disavow allegiance. I have one that says disavow allegiance from uh, Grand Duke Frederick from uh, Baden. So that can at least help you narrow it down. And then if you've got an area, number six, you can use some immigration books and databases. Um, I think I listed uh, some places to look for these immigration databases. There's all kinds of them um, on um, different websites that have listed them. For, and they're kind of regional, you know, because these are local historians and people that are putting together um, these records, these immigration records that they find from ports and, and uh, newspapers. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. Um, so at least if you've got an area, then you can start looking at these immigration uh, databases and books. Uh, so our genealogy library in St. Louis has tons of um, these books also. So like I said, don't forget about books. Not everything has been digitized and online. Um, and I know everybody's always searching for their passenger list uh, and some people with the hope that it's going to say where they came from. And of course, um, we all want to know when they came and how they came and that. But uh, uh, for the most part, they don't tell you, except for the past um, some years I've been doing some research for people and found um, a lot of New Orleans passenger lists in the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, remarkably, gave a lot of uh, hometown names for people on those ships. So if you're lucky and they came into New Orleans, you might, uh, in those years, you might see that. When I mentioned immigration into the U.S., I'm talking about uh, castlegarden.org and uh, ellisisland.org. Of course, Ellis Island wasn't opened until 1892. And like me, I thought, oh, well, my person was here in 1870 something, so that's not any good for me. Um, and then someone told me, well, they may have went back. And I was like, no, they were too poor. But, uh, you know, eat my own words. Um, he did go back. My, my French great-grandfather went back um, in 1903. And so I found him in the Hamburg uh, uh, passenger list coming back. And if they did go to um, overseas by then, they would have had to have gotten a passport. So I think the um, passports for the United States uh, starting way back are on Ancestry, I think. 
So don't discount that. And also, again, too, you might have, uh, like his brother also went back and uh, he named the place that he was going to the exact, you know, because at Ellis Island, they sometimes ask where you were going and, and, and then people coming in, they ask where you're, come, where you're going to in the United States. So you might find relatives that are coming over at a later date to, and if, if you look at the same surname and you see that they're coming to the state or even the address of where your people live, then it's possible that the, the town name might be listed on their records. And again, as I said about going really local, um, you know, once you know where they live, you want to check the county and community. Sometimes they have histories, county histories in that. They might talk about the first people that established the uh, uh, village or town here and that they were a group of Germans from such and such a place. And so they'll give you something to, to look at. Um, church histories, they're, they're jubilee things. Sometimes they'll talk about the first uh, people that start, especially if they're starting you know, a German uh, church, you know, they like list who the original families were and you could maybe search some of those people too. Because a lot of times they, uh, your people came to where they knew somebody. And so, you know, they could have been uh, family members and relatives and friends that um, they were uh, hanging around. So you want to search those people too. And of course, uh, lastly, you know, you're going to, I know everybody's going to go to Ancestry or Family Search and, and look. Um, online trees, um, as much as I, um, you know, think that they've got lots of bad information, uh, sometimes it's a source for, you know, a finding, seeing if somebody does have some good information. If they have documentation, uh, that then you can, you know, go from there and you can kind of believe it. But uh, if they don't have any documentation, you could take their ideas as hints and then you be the good researcher and find the uh, the documents that back that up. But just don't copy and paste it and, and put it on just because uh, somebody's got something on there. And a lot of times I see all the only documentation they really have is, is uh, census records from here. So that um, that's not going to, to help. So that's my best approach is, um, and I also did, um, not up there yet, but I'm going to put it up there soon as soon as I uh, get it finished editing and uh, a beginning German genealogy uh, webinar that I've done. So I'll put that on our my website uh, soon, as soon as I get finished doing that. So go on to the next question. And this one was really kind of a hard one. And as I said, I don't know if the person that, that um, asked this is, is on the call or not. Did any of the Germans displaced in 1945 return to their homes? We weren't exactly sure what displaced Germans. Uh, if you mean somebody that lived in Germany and their village was maybe destroyed and, and they had to leave until it got rebuilt or something? Or we're tending to think that it probably means that people that, Germans that were living as Germans, but in what is now other countries. After the war, the land that they were occupying was given back to Poland or Czechoslovakia or whatever. Uh, so we're kind of thinking about that, um, that that's maybe what you mean. I mean, that's really hard because I don't really have a good answer as to um, did they go back? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Matthias has told, um, told me we were in a museum one time and anyway, he told me the story about how, you know, there was like, I think he told me it was like almost 12 million people that were displaced from these countries that were sent back to Germany after the war. And they had, you know, no place they could handle all of those people. So they were just sent out all over Germany and sent to as many villages and towns as they could find. And the people, you know, as devastated as the country was at that time, but people had to take these people into their own home. Everybody, you know, took some people in because um, they just, there was no place for them to go. And uh, so whether those people would have ever gone back to, let's say, Poland or Czech Republic, um, we don't know. Um, Matisse seems to think that maybe not, because they might not have been wanted by that time, but you know, it, it, it's possible. So our best thought on this would, have, would be that uh, if you know the hometown that you're talking about, you could try contacting the local Standesamt or uh, the Bürgermeister, which is the city hall office, to see if they have anything like city directories. Um, you know, they maybe not have anything printed for 45, 46, but maybe you could look in the last of the 1840s and see if that surname is, is in a city directory. Um, 
Einwohner list is a it's kind of like a citizen list, and, and that's just another word that you could use for um, if you're looking at searches and like family search catalog search, you could put that word in Einwohner list because these things go back, you know, centuries. So they were always making lists of their people. So um, if you know a particular place that you're looking for, you can um, you know put that in and see if they got any Einwohner list. And uh, Melda registers. Um, that, I found that on Family Search and some of the things. And, and Matthias, if you want to maybe get on and, and try to explain this, because uh, he, he lives in Germany, so he should know this. But I'll just say one thing about it. It's kind of something like uh, like when we would move to a new city or something, we have to go and register to vote, or we have to change our address, to the driver's license and stuff. So in Germany, when you move from one place to the other, you have to check into the town and tell them where you're going. Is that is that kind of right, Matthias? Yeah, they, they know exactly what street and house you are living. <laughs> yes. so say, even if you move inside the town, I have you have to go to the town hall and tell that you are moving from this street, house number Z, to the other street, what I have done. So, and they make, um, they change your, uh, yeah, what you, what's, driver license, passport, everything. Uh-huh. So this is for, yeah, for taxes reason, for, for right. election and, and, and all this kind of stuff. So and I, so I that just, you don't lose anybody. So they don't lose anybody. That's right. <laughs> so I have seen these in um, in Family Search um, you know, in regards to older older things too. So, but for for the um, 1940s and that you could I would check with the Burgermeister's office or City Hall or something to see if they have you know they've been doing that. And I'm sure Matthias they would have been doing that in the 40s, right? Mm, sorry, I was just typing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. The question. Uh, I said they probably would have been doing something like this uh, as late as the, or early as the 40s, too, because they've been doing it for centuries. With the, with the, with the Milder Register? Yeah. Yeah, this was done under, under I guess the, the first one was under the Prussian government. So oh. what is, we have what, we've got something from my great-grandfather. This was from the beginning of the 19th century, and there must have even been also something before. Oh, boy. I'm just, yeah. So those are just a couple of words that you could use. So that was, that's kind of the only suggestion that we could have to see, you know, to try to find, um, you know, people that have gone back to their town. And also if, um, in, uh, I haven't done this too much because, yes. But it doesn't mean that they exist all. Yeah, they still exist. Um, because yeah. I have some, some cases that where they got lost in the second world war. Oh, that's true. But this would be mm -hmm. if they started them up again after afterwards to see whether the people who came back. So that that was our suggestion. And uh, so, uh, what I started to say was in, in family search also, if you know a town, a German name, let's say that, that your people lived in a in what's now Poland, but they, they told you the German hometown name. If you put that into a place search in family search, I think sometimes they tell you what the name in Poland now is, you know, so. Um, maybe uh, you can see what kind of records they have for that or else you'd get the name and in, in what the Polish name is now. In regards to um, obituaries since 1980, um, and Matisha, well, I'll let you do your thing here for a minute, but um, um, that's kind of hard to say too because um, you'd have to know the town, you know, just like here, you'd have to know where they are. Um, and Matthias told me that they're not as, um, family history oriented is kind of like ours, at least tells um, relationships between people. Sometimes you'll get an obit and they'll name some people in there, but uh, they don't tell you who they, you know, how they're related to the deceased. But this Gen Wiki site, um, and it, it, that, it might come up in English, but I'm giving you the German word there, um, just in case, token settle, that um, there's some, you know, Catholic death cards, and uh, they have a collection of that on there. Also in the handout, I put in a couple other sites that um, for places that are give obituaries um, that have collections of obituaries. But um, otherwise, on this um, uh, genealogy net here, um, there's also a, a, a tab on there that's called um, well in English it would be like um, advertisements, and in German I think they're calling it Familienanzeigen. Um, and that is a, a, just announcements like in, in certain areas of Germany, they'll tell you there's, they've got some from Baden, they've got some from here, they've got some from there. And it's like, you know, marriage announcements, uh, death announcements, and, uh, and a little bit more um, 
newer, you know, than way back when. So you might try that. Um, and again, if you know um, if you know a town name, you're going to have to do some googling to find out, you know, what their local newspaper might be. And then you could just do a search and Google search for that that uh, place and that paper. And uh, these are a couple of words for obituaries: Derbenanzeigen and Totenanzeigen. So um, you can try that. Um, and as I said, you can just try Googling your surname and your place and, and, and that um, one of those words and then you can see if anything comes up for that. And I did, we did put some links to some places that had um, some obituaries. And if you're talking about Poland, you know, then you can try, if you know the Polish name of the town or the Czech name of the town, you can try some of these same techniques. I don't know if there's anything on GenWiki for that. But this was a hard one, and uh, because uh, you know we have uh, this type of a situation, it's hard to know where people uh, where they ended up. But those were just a couple of the ideas that we had. So hopefully that helps you some. Uh, next question was I'm looking for some ideas for where to look for adoption in Bavaria. My grandfather was born in 1861 in a very small town that I can't pronounce, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, I'll let Matthias do that, but it's near Neustadt on der Eich, and his mother died and his aunt brought him to the United States around the age of three. I have found his birth in Bavaria and I have found his confirmation in St. Louis, and I do not know if his aunt was on his maternal or paternal side, and I cannot find him on any ship's manifest, so I thought there might be a record um, in adoption or of adoption, or maybe a record of his getting permission for leaving Germany, but I'm not sure what record set to look for. So again, I don't know who submitted this, but we had some questions. So if you found the birth in Bavaria, what document was that? Was it a church record that was showing his baptism and would have given his mother's name, um, hopefully, um, if, she, if the child was illegitimate, you know, they usually wrote the mother's maiden name in there and that it was legitimate or illegitimate. If there was a father mentioned, um, then you've got the paternal name and you've got the maid, mother's maid name, you should um, get that in a church record. Uh, what was the aunt's name? Do you know her maiden name? Was she a sponsor at the birth? Uh, was she living in Bavaria or already, <clears throat> excuse me, already in the US and came back to get him? Um, and if you did, if the record that you found was not a church record, then you might have to know what religion they were to look in the correct church book. So again, our favorite place, go back to Myers Gaz, and for this village uh, that I cannot pronounce, uh, it shows um, that the Catholic parish is in Weisendorf and the Protestant parish is in Doxbach. And when that might sound confusing to people, some people, but not every village had a parish. Um, they might have had to walk uh, several miles over to the next village that had the, the, the uh, church. So that's another reason for using Myers Gaz. If you've got a town name, you don't know whether there's a church there or not. So you have to look at Myers Gaz to see whether there is a parish there. And um, so they show you, you know, where those parishes were. We could not find anything for Weisendorf um, that was on you know, family search or, or matricula or anything. So we're assuming that those records are still either local or at the Bomberg archive, possibly. Um, the Protestant records, um, the Protestant parish is Docs Bach, and those records are available online at archeon.de. So what I would suggest is that you, you check those church book records for the mothers and the aunts' maiden names to see if it's a family connection, to see whether she was, um, uh, you know, a sister or related to the mother or the father. And if the father was given in there, then if, if you find the aunt's maiden name, then you can maybe figure out a family connection that way. And then what you're going to have to do is go very local and uh, try contacting the town hall again to see where um, adoption, if there were any adoption or guardianship records might be. Um, depending on the town, they might have a, a town archive, um, a county archive that would hold some kind of records like that. So um, this particular town that I can't say um, is now part of Doxbach. And so um, you would that the first link there is for the town of Doxbach. Uh, the second link is for the church that's there so that you can you know, write a letter to the church and ask if, uh, and I don't know, maybe some of you that are experienced in uh, German research, uh, I asked Matthias, he didn't seem to know, have seen too often uh, 
if there was adoption mentioned in church book records, maybe in that child's uh, baptism. And, you know, sometimes pastors were good about going back and making comments later that, you know, they sometimes would go back and put a little cross to say when somebody died. Or a lot of times you'll find that they mentioned that this particular person um, went to America. So I don't know whether there was any, um, you know, comment put in there about being adopted. Um, and then the last link there is um, for the Doc Spock mayor, and that's the Burgermeister's office and that. So, I mean, I'd start off there and ask either the church and or the uh, civil register office whether they know if there was any type of uh, adoption or, or guardian records. Um, you know, Germans are pretty good about recording everything, and I would think, um, you know, if you have a, a child that was, you know, left like that, um, you would appoint a, some kind of a guardian for it at least. Um, and then she asked about the immigration records, and we talked about that a little bit earlier, about those databases and that. So part of the process of when people went to immigrate legally, they would have gone to the local court and, and applied for uh, immigration. And then part of the process was usually that they had to put an announcement in the local papers. It could be the you know, very local or it could have been a county-wide or something that these people are, are, you know, going to be leaving on such and such a date or whatever. And, um, you know, if you have any cause against them, do they owe you money? Or is it a father trying to get away from children, you know, children that he doesn't want to take care of or whatever? So you would have a certain amount of time to, to try to uh, catch up with those. So a lot of um, historians and researchers in, in the past have collected those things from the archives and gone around and collected these and that's what they're making these databases out of a lot of times is these um, newspaper um, announcements from that. That's how I found one of my Bavarian um, grandmothers that uh, a researcher that someone turned me on to had a uh, date, not, not, not a database, this was a long time ago so it was just hard file or something and don't everybody email me about this because I don't think he's doing it anymore, I'm not even sure if he's still alive. But, um, and I don't know what happened to the cards. I, uh, but anyway, the, he had the newspaper announcement for my grandmother and I found the, uh, the town name. So in the um, handout, I put a couple of links for Bavarian immigrant lists. You can email me. Um, I do have a CD that um, I got uh, at a genealogy day in, in um, Germany. One time we went to a, a genealogy day over there and the Bavarian a genealogy group was selling these CDs of, of some immigrants. So I could look on that, but I didn't know the name. And then a, a friend of mine in my German research group, he told me a hint a, a while back about uh, looking for Bavarians. If uh, on Google Books, um, and I put this in the handout also, um, Intelligent Blots, um, for, that's a newspaper, and I think it was for um, Lower Franconia, and it could be the same name for um, you know, upper uh, over uh, Franken or whatever, but he did a, a in this Google Books things. He you know put the newspaper name in, um, and then the year that the people immigrated, and then the the name, and then sometimes it'll you know the OCR will find that in this uh, newspaper collection. So you might try that also. I put step by step in the uh, in the handout for that too. So next question was kind of a long one too. Uh, what was the usual route that Westphalian immigrants took around 1849 to arrive at the port of La Havre? Did they travel up the Rhine River or overland? Did they catch a ride um, in the empty carts, freight wagons, after these delivered their cotton to the mills in Alsace? Did they go to Paris, then down the Seine to La Havre? How did they travel with their belongings, carts and wagons and boats, barge? And how long did it take them to travel from around the Cleva area to La Havre? How long did it take them usually to make the trek? Anyway, how long, how long, how long, and how did they get there? So um, that was a lot of questions <laughs> in one, but um, it was interesting to me. Um, I found it fun researching a little bit as uh, I too had um, people that left out of that port. And uh, so I did, don't have specific information for how your immigrant um, actually came, but I did find a very interesting blog uh, by someone whose ancestors also left from there. And she did some research with the help of her sister who uh, translated some French uh, documents uh, to give a picture of what it was like to get to Le Havre and uh, to ship out from there. 
So the, the link is in the handout again, but I'm gonna read a little bit about what this uh, experience was about. Um, and La Havre was a, remained a place of passage for those who sought immigration to the US and the transatlantic trips became important in the second half of the 19th century. Um, there was, um, throughout Germany at, at these times when the big immigration waves came about, there was lots of handbooks written um, by different people about how to immigrate and you know the best you know how to get um, the phrases in German and English and what kind of regulations certain uh, ship lines would have for steerage passengers what's the best you know route to go or whatever um, and there was immigration agents that were you know when this when they figured out that this was going to be a pretty big business you know there'd be people that would be out in the countryside uh, immigration agents that would sell tickets and things to people. Um, so La Havre was an important port for immigrants from Switzerland, southwestern Germany, and Bavaria. The developing cotton industry in Alsace required raw material from the U.S., of course, cotton. Uh, German disunity and the resulting multiple tariffs imposed on Rhine River traffic made it cheaper to go overland across France. Um, and of course, you know, for all of you that have been on a Rhine cruise and you know all the pretty uh, castles here, there, everywhere, they're just dotted along those things. Uh, they weren't just there to look pretty. <laughs> those were usually somebody's uh, property and they were collecting tolls along the river. So if you've been on that Rhine cruise and through that one stretch where there's castle after castle, you can imagine how many times you would have had to stop maybe and pay taxes or something, uh, or tolls. As elsewhere, the shipment of persons was a byproduct of commercial shipments. So these um, cotton ships that brought cotton over, then they didn't want to go back home empty, so they would uh, retrofit in their ships a little bit and take passengers. Uh, same thing I, I learned uh, in Bremen, that uh, especially around the end of the 1700s, 1800s, there was quite a route between Baltimore and Bremen that uh, they were bringing tobacco over there, and so the tobacco would be dropped off in Germany, and um, interestingly, uh, I find that it was sent out into the countryside, and you know, for some of you that had people that lived up in the Northwest, or uh, probably maybe other areas too, uh, a lot of your ancestor was a cigar maker, so they would get this uh, tobacco in, and then they would use that as cottage industries. They would have um, places in their homes to, to make cigars. So they did the same things when these boats would come in and, and drop all that off, and they didn't want to go back empty, so they would um, fill it up with, with immigrants. Um, immigrants could obtain, um, could obtain uh, transport on freight wagons returning from the east, and as a result, traffic between New Orleans and La Havre was particularly important, although New York was also involved in the trade in cotton and was, of course, a magnet for immigrants. And the majority of these uh, immigrants did not remain in Louisiana if they came into New Orleans, but proceeded up the Mississippi, uh, to St. Louis and Cincinnati by steamboat, um, at least before the expansion of the U.S. railway system. In 1818, uh, the passage from La Havre to America was 350 to 400 francs. Um, in the early 1830s, it was 120 to 150 francs, and this was due to, a, you know, the increase in shipping, which led to a decrease in prices for the transport. Uh, most immigrants would have sold off as many of their possessions as they could to make money for the voyage. Um, according to a personal story of a family's immigration from the Moselle area of France, which was in north, um, uh, east of, of France, to La Havre, the blogger quotes, after selling possessions, the family would need passports to leave France or Germany to go to the US and also passports to travel through other cantons in France. Or for Germans, they probably had to show something to get through other kingdoms, principalities or stuff on their way. Remember before 1870, if they were traveling, uh, they might have lived in, in Hessen-Darmstadt and you know, just to get through there and to go through the Rhineland or whatever, they, they would have had to have had some kind of a, a pass to, to show that to let them go through there. Um, so this, <laughs> the majority of um, uh, oh, I, I wanted to, I'm sorry, I wanted to show you the wagons. So this is a, from a painting in a, in a German museum here, but this shows the kind of a wagon that they would have, um, uh, maybe would have traveled. This is a of course, immigrants leaving their village and, and saying goodbye to everyone. 
the picture on the bottom right is the one that the blogger had used. She had, had gotten that picture from a living history museum near Trier in, the, in Germany. And the upper right one is um, from Ballenstadt Immigrant Museum that we visited in uh, Hamburg. And so this was one of their displays as to how people got to the ports there too. So that, you know, the majority of them made their way um, up to the port of embarkation at La Havre. Um, perhaps they would have joined other immigrants in something like a wagon train for more safety and for companionship. And of course, you know, the roads um, were rough and so the convoy would have, you know, moved slowly. Um, and for, from the area from Moselle, which is, you know, like to the northwest part of France, it took approximately three weeks by uh, wagon to get to, um, to La Havre. Um, and so, of course, depending on um, where your ancestors lived, a river might have been easier to use to get them to a port city. And also by the mid uh, late 1840s, train travel was accessible in Germany. So that's what I was going to show you here. I know this looks like a big mess. So what is this? You can see up on the right, you know, Poland and down in the left hand corner is Frankfurt, which is France. And, um, but the, it's, this is the Eisenbahn Karte, so a, a train uh, map of Deutschland in 1849. So I'm going to zero in on the particular place that she had mentioned so to see what trains were available. So what she was talking about Kleva and uh, as you see, I don't know if you can see that or not, it's spelled with a C there. So sometimes two new uh, German researchers, some consonants, you know, are interchangeable. So don't think it's not the right place if you see it spelled a di little different way. And if you noticed, I said it with, um, Clava, and as most Americans, we say uh, cleave, but, um, and this is not 100%, but for most uh, German words that end in an E, you say it like an A. So if you're in Germany and you're going to, you know, try to tell somebody where your hometown is, just kind of remember that, you know, because a lot of times if we say it the way we do, cleave, they're not going to, like, what, where's that? Never heard of it. So, um, you know, there's lots of um, towns that have, um, like, Holta. And we would say Holte, H-O-L-T-E. Um, I live near a town, a little town called New Melle, M-E-L-L-E. And in Germany, it's Mella, M-E-L-L-E. So just remember that. But if, you, if we look at Kleva, um, and there, you know, if you come down a little bit here to Dusseldorf, if you can get, these are, these are train tracks. And this is Cologne. Um, can't say the way they say it either. But as early as 18, in the late 1840s, 1850, the port city of La Havre could be reached by train from Cologne. So if you wanted to go um, from Germany, um, German, some German territory uh, close to Cologne, um, you, could, um, you only had to change trains in Paris and you reached the port uh, city relatively easily. So if you can see from up here, it's a possibility that that's what they would have done. If you see you travel across or down here to Paris, and then they only had to change once, and then they went to La Havre. So um, that's a possibility, or they would have gone by cart. Um, and you know, so if it's um, three weeks, like this is this is the Moselle over here. So if it took them three weeks to get from here over here to uh, La Havre, you can kind of estimate what that was. Um, but I was going to say, having used trains in Germany often and sometimes with luggage, I sure don't uh, envy immigrant families taking all their earthly belongings and, and, and children on and off trains. Um, they would have likely had a large trunk and sacks with food for the journey, which would then need to be replenished for the uh, ship's crossing, too. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of a uh, steam train that Matthias and I took a ride on a few years back. Um, you know, most trains were likely coal fed, so they would have belched smoke back into the passenger cars. The seats were of wood, and every movement of the train on the track would have uh, been felt. And um, I can attest to that because the week, this was a special occasion that this was up in the Northwest area. See the pretty yellow fields in, in May up there. But, um, you know, they, they ran this train uh, down a 20 minute, 30 minute ride or something, and then turned around and came back. But the seats were of wood, very hard, and very made you sit up upright. Uh, it had to sit really straight, so um, I can imagine what a, what a ride. But, but I'm sure that they were appreciative of this uh, faster uh, mode of transportation that they had, uh, even if 
they had to stop and, and, uh, and it was a little bit uh, a rough ride. But once they arrived in the port city, especially before 1850, they were not able to embark right away. Um, in bad weather, the ships were clustered close alongside and, and prevented from departing because of the direction of the wind. Uh, so the travelers may had to have stayed for weeks until they were able to leave. Um, this caused more expense for food and lodging. If you could stay at a guest house, um, if not, more or less fortunate people would you know, sleep in the street, uh, on the floor somewhere, and uh, in makeshift tents. Um, and this situation would lead to crime and unscrupulous con men who would, you know, try to sell them tickets or provisions that, you know, never materialized. Um, in Bremen and later in Hamburg, um, I learned that there were special immigrant houses that were built to hold passengers um, until their departure to make it a little bit safer for them. And uh, then they sailed. So I'm not going to go into that journey. I'm sure you've read stuff about that. But uh, I do have uh, included a link in this handout, um, a way to see how long the journey was. And But there's um, a few little... Uh, caveats about this. You have to know the ship's name, but if you've found their records here in the United States and you know what ship that they were on and you know when it arrived and it sailed from Bremen, um, then you can click on this link that we've pr provided in there and you can then they give you a list of the different ship's names and you can click on that and then by the year that your people arrived you can kind of see what date that they probably departed and so then you can see what kind of um, uh, how long the journey was for them. Um, and another place to find out more about the trip over is, and I had heard this years ago from uh, Dr. Coletta, I don't know if any of you have seen him and, and give talks before, um, the New York Times, uh, which is now on newspapers.com, it goes back to about 1832, I think. But if, if your folks arrived after September the 18th, 1851, and you know the name of the ship, you can check this uh, newspaper, and sometimes it's on the front page, and sometimes he said it would, you know, something that would say maritime or, or marine intelligence or something, they would give a list of the ships that came into the port that day. And you could, you know, maybe get some more information. They talk about cargo or maybe how many passengers or if something, you know, happened on the trip that could be, uh, could be put in there. So um, that's, like I said, I put that link in there too. So we're Getting closer to the end, I'm sorry. So what is an art super book? Um, people have asked, and probably a lot of you know what that is. Uh, but if you don't, and you have one for your town, you're really, really lucky. <laughs> so um, art familium book or art super book is um, uh, what they're called in Germany. And these are really like village um, family books or town genealogies. And what they uh, have done, somebody, a historian or a researcher, has compiled lineage-linked lists for everyone in the village. So they've either, t either taken the church books or civil registers or combination of both, um, and they've listed um, everybody in the village. Now, you have to be careful, and of course the front pages of these books are, of course, written in German. But these are typed, and they're, you, know, you can follow the surnames and stuff, and this is it's easy, pretty easy. But the sourcing in the front of the book, um, I would suggest you, you know, try to Google Translate that because Matthias and I met a really nice uh, older gentleman that had written many um, parts of the books for the Rhineland area um, or some area of the Rhineland. And you know, he told us that he used you know, the church records and civil records and um, other little factors, uh, other places that he found uh, court records or something that he would use to make sure he's got as much information in there as possible. But he told us that, you know, some people, if let's say there's two uh, churches in town, a Catholic and a, and a Protestant church, some people only did one church. So if you've got the, the book for, you know, say, Holta, and um, you look in it and your people aren't in there, you're thinking, well, wait a minute here. But they could have only been using one church record. So uh, keep that in mind that you should look and see what their sources are. It's arranged by surname and then the marriage date. So like I said, if you've got this for your hometown and they're not, all over Germany. There's, you know, different areas are, have them more often than not. Um, so, um, and I've put links into the handout where you can find some of these books that are online. And, um, well, I'm going to go down here. Sorry, combined, civil, and other sources. And some are online. So, um, as I said, if, if if it goes back to the beginning of church records, you can just follow your line all the way back. I do recommend that you know you also look at the church books because anything 
anytime something is being transcribed, it could be um, having a mistake in there. But, um, and I have to toot the horn for St. Louis uh, County Library, um, the History and Genealogy Department um, has hundreds of um, Orts of books um, in their um, library. So I put a link in there for that. You can look up and see if they have you know, one for your town and um, they can, you can email them and see if they do a lookup for you. But there are some online and, uh, but um, anyway, you can, if you find out, and some of them are also um, on family search too. You can look in, in that uh, search, place search. Um, I said that already, some are genealogy libraries. So, um, and this is kind of a travel related thing. Um, wasn't really sure exactly are the places we stay personal homes or hotels? Does only one person stay at this place or do you need a roommate? I don't speak German, but I think most people speak English. So I'm assuming this is in regards to our trips. And um, and I'm not sure, no, we wouldn't stay in personal homes, but I, I maybe she's meaning on when you go out to visit your hometown. But what we normally stay in is uh, we stay in smaller villages and we try to stay in a, like a guest house or a you know, family owned um, um, B and B, and when I say that, it's not like B and Bs here. It's, it's it, they're more like little hotels. And I still have people ask me if the if the bathroom is down the hall. And no, usually there's bathrooms in every room. And uh, so, but we try to we don't try to stay in uh, you know box uh, regular you know chain uh, hotels. As a matter of fact, most of the time you can only find those in bigger cities in Germany. You're not going to have a Holiday Inn in little villages or anything. So we do stay in an airport hotel when we come in and go out. Um, and she asked about a roommate. And uh, no, we have single beds. We have single rooms and, and double rooms. But I wanted to show you, um, for those of you that might be traveling, if you're not married or if you're uh, maybe with your siblings and you don't mind laying next to each other, that's what a double room usually looks like. The beds are usually um, two twin beds pushed together in some kind of a frame. So you can't always get them apart. Um, and you can't, uh, sometimes some of these uh, guest houses don't have um, twin rooms where there's two separate beds like that. So you have to, but uh, the one, one good thing about this is if you do uh, lay next to somebody on this, you don't really feel them moving around too much because you're in two separate beds. So um, I don't speak German, but I think most people speak English. Yes, for the most part, a lot of people speak English. It just depends, depends on where you are. Um, you can be in certain areas of Germany say Mecklenburg or a lot of places in the east, you might have it a little bit harder to find um, English speakers. Um, and, you know, it just depends. So you have to be prepared with a few little sentences or have a, a Google Translate on your phone or something. But uh, for the most part, yes, you can find somebody that speaks English. Okay, so this is uh, the, the last. Uh, what about German cemeteries? So uh, as I said, most people ask me right away, oh, I wanna go see my um, ancestor's grave. And I have to tell them that there probably isn't too, too often that there is old graves. You know, their um, German uh, plots are recycled. Uh, they are leased for a period of time, usually 20 to 40 years, depending on area and place. Uh, bodies are not in, embalmed, so they uh, decompose faster. Um, the casket is usually wood or something that will decompose um, quickly, more quickly. Um, they do have cremation and, and bury the ashes and um, cemeteries are usually maintained mainly by the families. And I wanted to show you a few pictures of some cemeteries. Matthias and I have been to lots of cemeteries in Germany, not in different areas, but not everyone, of course. So somebody might do something a little bit different than what this is, but um, but they're very beautiful, um, very peaceful, and uh, for the most part they're like parks. This is in Borkelshausen in Westphalen, and um, you know as you see, and I, I don't know if Matthias can turn his thing on. You know the family usually plants the the flowers on the grave plot that they that that they're leasing, but I don't know whether the cemetery itself puts in any of these um, uh, you know pine trees or anything like that. So, I don't know if that's his family or not. Um, Matthias is busy. You can answer that as we go along. Uh, please. Um, you know, the, these, uh, the big pine trees and the bushes that are there, do the families plant those or is the cemetery sometimes put those in? Mm, sometimes the cemetery, uh, the cemetery, in most cases, the big ones, uh, I don't think this is, um, besides but, it's very old. Yeah. 
What about like those rhododendron plants? <laughs> this is probably done maybe by the family. By the family, yeah. It mm, can also be done by the cemetery, but we have also such a bush on our grave. On your graves? Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this was another one that was in Westphalen in, in Holta. Notice, and this was a really pretty one. It was up on top of a, a hill and looking down over the valley. Um, but just to show, kind of show you how um, people maintain their uh, stones. And the stones are, are very nice. As you see, they're granite and beautiful. And, and people always ask me, well, what do they do with them? <laughs> After, you know, if your lease is up, what do you do with the stones? And what's your answer, Matthias? Look at just try it. Uh, can take them home. Uh, there's not so many people who maybe take them home, but normally get destroyed and yeah, you are trash for the streets or for whatever. You can use stones. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Because they're beautiful stones. Um, and this is up in Schleswig, and it just kind of to show you that you know, see the round, more rounded uh, uh, stones, uh, just like uh, the farmhouses and that are different, uh, similar but different in uh, different areas of Germany. Different cemeteries have uh, different ways of uh, um, stones and the way that they uh, do their do their plots. Um, this was was up in Hanabi, Schleswig, also, and um, the the little fence around it. Um, you don't see that too much now up there. We this looks like it's it's like some kind of a military thing, as you see. And I meant to blow up that uh, that cross there with the uh, red uh, cross on there. That um, was for a soldier that was killed during the um, German uh, Denmark or Danish War. And I when I was up there, I finally found out since I never had anybody from that area that uh, this uh, northern Schleswig uh, was Denmark until 1866. So that must have been for our soldiers. But we also noticed in Mecklenburg in the cemeteries, that sometimes there'd be these little areas that were fenced around and you might sometimes find older graves in there, but they were usually uh, the noble family that had uh, those in the cemetery. Most of the regular poor people were long gone. Um, speaking of Mecklenburg, this was a cemetery that we went to in Mecklenburg, and just to show you again how you know they do different things in, in different areas, and this is kind of a blow up of, of, of Mecklenburg also. You see how the dirt is, uh, looks like it's raped, and that's exactly what it was. Um, and when you go to a cemetery, uh, usually there's a spigot for water, and there's all kinds of like a little uh, holder for all kinds of buckets. I guess the families have their own buckets there so they can you know, water all these flowers. And this particular one had a uh, had a whole bunch of rakes hanging there so that people that came in. So I was very self-conscious about making sure I did not walk across their freshly raked uh, gravestones. So it's all nice and neat. Um, this is in Mecklenburg again too and you see how uh, it uh, had a fence around the whole cemetery or stone on stone wall and just a different um, way that somebody did um, their grave. Um, and this is we go way south into uh, Bavaria by the Alps, um, Tergen Sea, and this is just the most picture perfect little uh, Bavarian village. And this was a Catholic cemetery. And so you see it's not so much grass, it was near to the church, um, not so much grass, but more um, ornate, um, especially more crosses and uh, just you know, gobs and gobs of flowers. But just a beautiful um, area to be laid to rest uh, on this beautiful lake down there. This was one in, in France, in the Alsace area, Vittelsheim, France. And again, theirs is just a little bit different where they, um, you know, a lot of rock. And then people would come and, uh, I guess, bring, or the family members would put these little uh, mementos on there. Uh, for their um, uh, people. And now, in this story, I'm, this is it, this is the end, so I'm, I'm just going to make this, try to make it quick, but you know, I always uh, started off by saying I, I have to tell people that they're never going to find their old um, graves. And so we had uh, taken a lady to her hometown, and this is in um, Laudenbach, um, Hesse, and um, it was a beautiful area too. Uh, this church was up on the hill. The, the pastor, you know, couldn't go with us, but he had somebody open the church for us. So it was just us three going over there to this church. And you kind of can see a couple of little headstones there in the uh, churchyard there. And uh, one of them was um, this old one. And uh, you know, we never, I've never seen anything like that with the people on top of it. And um, so it was, you know, 
it was an old one and Matthias uh, read it. It said it was from 1742. And uh, I made uh, Kim, I said, well, you don't ever see uh, old, old stones too much. So just stand in front of it, I'll take a picture. And we were really intrigued by what these figures on there meant. And so um, uh, walk around to the back side of it. And I know you can't read that at all, but it, it was difficult to read. But there was a, a bio of this person <laughs> that was buried in this grave. And Matthias could read some of it. And so what the story was, was that this was the gentleman here. And this was his first wife and children that had died before him. And as you see, these, these probably babies in their swaddling clothes. Uh, this was his current wife and his current children that were still alive. Um, so um, very interesting. And when you know we were reading it, and the guy's name was something Coke, K-O-C-H. And she said, oh, I have Cokes in my line. And so when Matthias um, got home, he goes to Archeon and looks, and lo and behold, this person was related to her. Um, and so I, I'm so thankful that we made her stand in front of that, um, <laughs> that stone, because uh, at the time we didn't know that that was related to her. Um, so, and this, um, this was done in Bavaria too. So people say, well, what happens, you know, if, if, you, if the family doesn't con continue the lease? So that's what happens. They take the stone, the headstone down, and uh, it's up for sale again. <laughs> so that's what happens to in German cemeteries. So that's the end. Um, I thank you for your kind attention. This is uh, our commercial here, uh, Family Tree Tours. We do specialize in Germany, and we go to other places too. Um, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to um, contact us. And I don't know, I know we've been over time a little bit, and so I wanted to, uh, uh, Matthias, do we have any uh, questions?